We often associate slavery with non-Christians and the Romans, but unfree people continued to be owned and exploited throughout Europe for hundreds of years after the fall of the Empire. In fact, slavery was alive and thriving very well in the medieval world. Let's travel back in time and hear some stories about people who were enslaved, bought, sold, and exploited during the Middle Ages. Welcome to Medieval Madness. Tell me you love me. Most of us have heard of medieval serfs. In the Middle Ages, serfdom was similar to slavery, but there was a distinct difference. It was their labor that was bought, not the person, who couldn't be sold or traded. Serfs lived and worked on their lord's land for two or three days a week, working half their time for themselves and half for their master. In return, they were usually given a piece of their own land to farm for the subsistence of their family. Serfs lost the freedom of movement, a serf was not allowed to leave the manorial lands without the lord's permission, but they were given the benefits of justice and protection. In the early Middle Ages, up to the year 1000, the practice of slavery that had been popular in the Roman world continued across Europe. Provisions for slaves were included in the laws of Welsh King Hywel the Good in the 10th century. In the Germanic kingdoms, the 7th century Visigothic Code proposed enslaving criminals as a form of punishment along with prisoners of war. The Vikings took thousands of people, men, women, and children from all over the known world and either kept them or sold them as slaves, naming them thralls. The 10th century traveller Ibn Hawqual wrote about a Viking slave trade that reached across the Mediterranean Sea from Spain to Egypt. It's thought that the Vikings specifically targeted women and girls on these raids, possibly because they practiced polygamy. That made it harder for low-status men to have access to women and created a need for sexual slaves and even wives. During a raid near Dublin, Ireland in 821, they carried off a great deal of women into captivity. It's thought that as much as 10% of Scandinavia was populated by slaves during the Viking era. In modern day Iceland, two thirds of the female population have a Celtic background, making it likely that their ancestors were brought there as slaves from Ireland and Scotland. If you want to learn more about Viking history, we have just started a new channel called The Viking Vault, so please do check that out and subscribe if that's something you're interested in. Money, money, money. By the late medieval period, the Mediterranean region had effectively become a slaving zone, with slaves being transported and sold in the coastal cities across both Christian and Muslim territories. People found themselves sold into slavery for a whole host of reasons, including war, raiding, and piracy. Many criminals were sentenced to slavery as a punishment, and some even sold themselves or their children because of crushing poverty. Slavers, for the most part, were attracted for no other reason than making money. Religion and politics didn't even enter into it. If the pirates could hold and demand a ransom for a person, they might be returned home, otherwise they were sold. Slavers were bought to be used for their labor in agriculture and as skilled crafts workers, as well as military, domestic, and sexual services. Some were motivated to buy slaves because of religion. Neither Christian, Muslim, nor Jew was allowed to enslave a fellow believer. But it was permissible to enslave a person from another religion and convert them to their own. In Italy, Venice and Genoa were two of the major slave centers. Genoese merchants controlled the port of Caffa on the Black Sea and used it as a slaving hub in the late 13th century. The Italians often sold men to the Egyptians who had a great demand for Mamluk slave soldiers and mercenaries. The Black Sea port sold people from all over Eastern Europe, including Russia, Bulgaria, Turkey, Greece, and Albania, and transported them to Southern Europe. The Mediterranean islands of Cyprus, Crete, Rhodes, Sicily, Sardinia, and Majorca also held slave markets where merchants would buy slaves cheaply and transport them to where there was more demand and more profits to be made. In Iberia, the main trading cities were Barcelona and Valencia. In Barcelona, 20% of households owned slaves. From 1415, the Portuguese brought more slaves from their exhibitions to the African coast to be traded in Europe. Sisterly love. During the later Middle Ages, the majority of European slaves were young females when they were purchased, and many were put to domestic work across Western Europe. But many also found themselves being sold into prostitution rings, bathhouses, and brothels. In the early years of the 11th century, Wolfstan, the Archbishop of York, wrote his most famous work. 
a homily titled The Sermon of the Wolf to the English. In it, Wolfstan blamed God's anger towards the English on their lack of morality. He even went so far as to blame the last 30 years of vicious Viking raids as a manifestation of God's fury. He described the horrors of the slave trade as, quote, and it is terrible to know what too many do often. Those who for a while carry out a miserable deed, who contribute together and buy a woman as a joint purchase between them, and practice foul sin with that one woman, one after another, and each after the other. Like dogs that care not about filth, and then for a price they sell a creature of God, his own purchase that he bought at a great cost, into the power of enemies. In 1367 in Marseille, southern France, a woman named Christine was sold. It doesn't bode well that the man who bought her was told that he could, quote, have her, hold her, give her, sell her, exchange her, and do all that he pleases with her. There was always hope though, as some slaves were able to buy their freedom. Debracha de Bosna was an enslaved woman in the Croatian city of Dubrovnik. In 1282, the city was known as Ragusa and was home to many slaves. A high proportion of them were traded via Venice, as Dubrovnik was part of the Venetian Empire. Dubrasha de Bosna was probably named after the area in which she was captured, being Bosnia. Records show that Dubrasha was able to buy her freedom through a process known as manumission, probably by saving up out of her measly earnings. Therefore, she was free to, quote, wander through the four corners of the earth wherever it should please her, free and liberated forever. But there was a price to pay, as recompense, Debrasha's sister was given to the master for four years in exchange to, quote, serve her owner in all ways according to his wishes. Which doesn't sound ideal. It seems that Debrasha either betrayed her sister and sold her into servitude, or the sisters had made a pact together to gain her freedom. Either way, Debrasha was free. Some slaves were liberated if their master chose to free them at his death, specifying his desire in his will. Others might be freed if their owner considered it an act of charity and wanted to earn some brownie points within the Christian church. Although it's worth saying that in a lot of circumstances when elderly slaves became infirm, they weren't worth keeping anyway. Suffer the children. Sadly, many women who were made to work in a domestic setting were subjected to some form of sexual abuse. Many became pregnant by their owners. Following the Roman slave laws, a child inherited their parents' status. That's how in 1465, a noble from Marseille named Pascal de Goldi was able to purchase a pregnant slave along with her four-year-old boy. De Goldi sold her son three years later. And in another heartbreaking tale, in the same city in 1377, a mistress sold her slave but kept the poor woman's one-year-old baby for herself. One woman decided she would fight to keep her children at all costs. Her name was Theodora, and she lived in Crete with her sons, Andronicus and Demetrios. In 1345, her owner, Pietro Porco, decided that he would sell the children, and he believed this was in his right because he legally owned their mother. At that time, Crete, like Dubrovnik, was part of the Venetian Empire. The magistrates there put a stop to the sale and ruled that, quote, the children are and will remain free forever. Another resident of Crete, a free woman named Maria, went to court when she was told that she had to give up her baby because the father was a slave. She won her case, and the child inherited her free status. You can be sure, however, that for every heartwarming tale of a mother winning the right to keep her child, there are hundreds more who had their children brutally snatched away because of their enslaved status. For the love of God. In 1393, three teenage slave girls named Grilika, Jona, and Trichislava were members of a Bosnian heretical sect. Remember that during the Middle Ages, many slaves were converted to Christianity after they became enslaved. Canon law in the Catholic Church condemned the enslavement of other Christians. So yes, you could own Christian slaves, but they had to have been heretics at the time of their subjugation. But these three young girls argued that they had, in fact, converted to Catholicism before they were enslaved, not after. The distinction in timing was crucial to the girl's case, ownership was invalidated, and all three were released from their bondage. Needless to say, the trader who owned them was furious. Freedom Another road to freedom was to escape and run away. 
Antoine Simon was a black slave who lived in Barcelona during the 1440s and was owned by a leading trader named Pons Ferro. Antoine had heard of the town of Palmiers in southern France, where slavery was illegal. So, in a desperate bid for freedom, he escaped and made his way across the Pyrenees Mountains in a journey that must have taken great courage and determination. On arrival in Palmiers, Antoine began to work for Pierre Toc, a man who was in the employment of the local count. Ferrer, furious at the loss of his slave, pursued Antoine to his new home and on his arrival in Palmiers, began legal proceedings against both Toc and his former slave. He accused Toc of theft and argued Antoine was his property. Before the court, Antoine argued that according to the law of Palmiers, his freedom was sacred and Toc agreed, stating that he had every right to employ Antoine as a free man. The court found in their favour, and Antoine was allowed to stay and live out the rest of his life in freedom. Unlike Antoine, most slaves were unable to find a way out of their bondage during the Middle Ages. Other places implemented similar rules. Toulouse was another French city that harboured slaves. Dubrovnik described the trading of people as, quote, Disgraceful, wicked, an abomination, and against all humanity, but held back from banning the owning of slaves. And although King Alfonso X of Castile passed a law which condemned slaving, the practice continued. Sadly, the medievals had found themselves reliant on trafficking and slavery, and the period became a stepping stone in the advancement of the transatlantic slave trade. In what was a mask for the economic need of slavery, the legal outlines were already being sought out that would justify the racial and religious need for the buying and selling of humans, when in 1452, the Pope issued a papal bull that would allow King Alfonso V of Portugal to enslave all pagans. It read, quote, full and free power to invade, conquer, fight, and subjugate pagans and other enemies of Christ, and to reduce their persons into perpetual servitude. Thank you for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. Please do subscribe if you're enjoying these videos, and I'll see you next week for another one. Have a great week. Cheers.